people who have great bone structure and space for the teeth mm -hmm. they tend to be very healthy because what i'm saying is something that gains good architecture mm -hmm. tends to be healthy yes because if you have poor architecture you would imagine that the structures or the functions the structure is responsible for won't function as well it's yeah so i run into that obstacle as well in, in explaining some of the things that i work with and it's it's strange to me that that that's even a, a radical idea i always say to people will a, will a wheel that's not round roll properly fine wait, wait till i go where where see i'm going with this logical conclusion so we know the people with really nice bone structure function well mm -hmm. now they also tend to look attractive hmm. that's where it gets complicated so you piss people off by saying that you're just pissing people off aren't you because let's say you're 50 years old and you're not very attractive nothing mm -hmm. to do about it bar surgery you're too late to change now mm -hmm. and it's your fault mm -hmm. and so you know but it might so i believe you know um so Darwin, um, you know, uh, most of evolution, most of or transmutation was um, was Erasmus Darwin. You know, Charles Darwin's grandfather came up with most of that. Charles Darwin just sat on his knee and said, hmm, that sounds interesting. Why was he in the Galapagos Islands? You know, just happened to be sailing around. Oh, look, look at that. No, clearly he went out to prove it. He already had these ideas. But it was, you know, his grandfather got, you know, a lot of stick, you know, was... He damaged him mentioning this. Charles's father didn't want to get involved for those reasons. So that's why Charles waited so long before he published the idea. And the real winning reason why he got recognition was, well, they'd had that idea for 50 years. It wasn't a new idea. Now, what Charles really added into this was the theory of mate selection. Why we choose a certain mate. You know, and I, you could hybridize it. You know, one of my lovely examples is the Hollywood human. Because if anyone who, you know, in Hollywood, let's say people, 50% of your success is acting ability and 50% is luck or family or whatever you did, but at least 50% is acting ability. We've only got to have three, four, five generations before you actually start generating actors, people who are genetically better to act in theory. You know, that's much better than survival of the fittest because the survival of the fittest is only going to take you so far. Remember, survival of the fittest is death of the weakest. So unless you go around either killing or sterilizing everyone with straight teeth and good faces, you're not going to get any change. Because mm -hmm. if everyone, as I said, all our ancestors had great facial form, perfectly straight teeth, stood upright and were fine. So that there's no, that we're not coming in with a genetic basis to cause these problems. However, when you're going back to that mate selection theory, you think logically about it. All right. So why? Why are we associating a face that works well as being attractive? Mm -hmm. Well, kind of makes logical sense, doesn't it? You know, anyone who's got a good facial growth is likely to be healthier. So in mm -hmm. a way, attractiveness and healthy, it's the same thing. Sure. You know, as I say, your, your face is the CV of your health. Mm -hmm. Someone who's got a great long jaw that solid jaw I've got is unlikely to get sleep apnea mm -hmm. and probably a host of other problems. Well, it's, it's interesting because you're, you're, the argument then is semantics because, you know, there's, there's studies that show that humans are biologically wired to seek out symmetry in what we that find. Quote unquote. Yeah, that, that, that is part of the work. That is part of the thing, because then I, I say that, you know, I, I'm a great illustration for why um, phase, so symmetry. So, you know, if your face grows fine like this and you go forward, you're symmetric. As it starts to bend down, mm -hmm. it's going to go asymmetric. Sure. How many cars that have had a head on collision are more symmetric after the head on collision? Very few, I would imagine. Yes. Most become asymmetric. As they crumple, as they buckle, they become asymmetric. Mm -hmm. So as your face downswings, mm -hmm. it buckles. I mean, in my view, the nasal septum, you know, deviated nasal septum, that's the classic example. You know, that, that is this. You know, you've got your nasal septum running up here. As you downswing, mm -hmm. it buckles. Mm -hmm. 
and then it bends one way or the other. What else is it going to do? So that's, that's very interesting. And that's also overlap between what we see with spines, because when a person goes into a severe forward head position, there's always a rotational component to it. Yeah. Well, in a way, I see um, scoliosis as a continuation of malocclusion. So that's that's why I really wanted to talk to you, because I do yeah. think that we're talking about two parts of the same thing. Yeah, you're holding your head forward like this. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And you've only got to get it off balance a little bit. Or yes. that muscular support to maintain this forward head posture only mm-hmm. has to be a little bit asymmetric. And you're done. If you enjoyed this short clip, you've got to hear the rest of what Dr. Mew had to say during our interview. I'm going to put a link for that here and also in the description down below.